Hello, I'm Angela Ward, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. The cold winter winds are blowing. You may be scraping your windshield before driving off in the morning. The days are short. The skies are blue-gray when it's not raining. But even with all of this, Puget Sound still offers you a good chance of landing a salmon. The salmon species that spawns the latest in Washington are our chum salmon. Typically, they enter our rivers in November and December. Um, they provide opportunities for those folks that just want to get out and catch that one last fish or fish all the way through till steelhead season starts. The other interesting aspect is that our chum salmon fisheries are often in places where folks don't need an expensive boat. They don't need a boat at all. They're shore based generally and we have a number of good rivers and in December we can still catch good numbers of chum um, in rivers such as the Skagit, Skykomish, the Nooksack, the green. Um, the best one in December is going to be the Nisqually. That's the one that has the highest catch in, in December of all of our Puget Sound streams. We're fishing on fish that are basically attempting to go up and spawn. And we have to make sure we manage those fisheries so that we leave enough fish to go up and spawn. But folks are going to catch fish uh, either accidentally or it just happens that they catch fish that they don't want to keep. Uh, the fish might be a little dark or it's the wrong species. We, we really need people to respect the fish that they're catching and releasing. Uh, these fish need to get up and spawn. Uh, the, their continued fishery depends on those fish successfully spawning and propagating the species. So when people catch these fish and release them, they should leave them in the water. They shouldn't drag them up on the bank. Uh, just get the hook out as quickly as you can with a pair of pliers and gently release the fish back in the water and make sure that that fish has the best chance of going up and spawning so that we can maintain these fisheries so you can come out and fish again in the future. So when, when you release your fish, you want to leave it in the water as best you can. And even if you're in a difficult place up on the rocks, maybe use a net if you have to, but try to leave the fish in the water. Uh, Josh from Auburn here is going to show us how to do it on a chum in a really difficult place, and he does a really good job of releasing the fish without dragging it up on the bank. <laughs> the chum is a really hard fighting fish. Um, their table fare is somewhat questionable unless they're really, really bright. So a lot of folks want to just come out and catch and release fish. Uh, so what these guys do is typically grab a steelhead rod, fairly light gear, maybe even a noodle rod, uh, something in the 10 to 12 pound class, so that they can have fun just fighting the fish and enjoying the feel of the tug on the rod. Uh, typical gear is uh, a pencil lead, a three to four foot leader, and just a corking yarn. Good colors are chartreuse, pink, um, some orange. Any of those combinations should work. It's not a real technical or sophisticated manner of fishing, uh, but it's a lot of fun if you enjoy fighting fish. And if you gear down to the lighter gear, you can have just a kick in the pants.
part of our agency's efforts to reestablish historic salmon runs in many of our rivers includes a simple technique. At the right time of year, planting dead salmon in a stream will attract new spawners while providing other benefits to our ecosystem. We're in the Tucannon River in southeastern Washington in Columbia County, and we're doing some stream nutrient enrichment by putting salmon carcasses out into the river. The salmon carcasses come from the hatchery. We collect them at the Tucannon River fish hatchery adult trap, and we take them to the Lions Ferry hatchery and spawn them. We're working with Tucannon River Spring Chinook, which are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Due to the low runs in recent years, this has decreased the amount of nutrients available to younger fish. Um, the adults, they, they decompose in the river, which provide nitrogen and phosphorus, which helps the algae and aquatic insects um, thrive, which the young juvenile salmon feed on the aquatic insects. So with higher numbers of aquatic insects, we have um, healthier and, and larger young salmon. It's a, it's a chance for us to give back uh, to nature what, what we sometimes take out, uh, the fishing groups and people that love to fish and, and see what's happening with uh, fish life. This is just one more way that we're trying to restore salmon in southeastern Washington. Some valuable wildlife habitat near Ellensburg is being improved through a scientific method of thinning the forest. While it may sound and look like a tree harvest, we're really returning this area back to its historic makeup. So we actually are uh, taking care of multiple goals. What we had was um, overstock stands, uh, meaning we had too many trees per acre, they were small in size, and the species composition uh, was actually inappropriate for the sites. Uh, most of this area historically would have been large diameter ponderosa pine, um, and what's happened with the fire suppression and the uh, past logging is we've gone from having large diameter pine to having small diameter pine and small diameter dug fir and true fir on these sites um, at much higher densities than they would have been historically. So what we're doing is uh, taking what we've got left, which is not a lot of large diameter stuff, but what we're doing is keeping the largest diameter pines and taking out the majority of the dug fur and the true fur to try and move these stands back to what they would have been historically. So by doing that, in the short term, we'll be providing habitat for um, big game species because these overstock stands, you have very little understory. The brush component is very suppressed, as is the, uh, the grass species. Once we open them up, um, the brush will be released, the grasses will be released, and we'll be providing good forage habitat for, for our big game species. Um, in the longer term, we'll be increasing the size diameter of the trees that are remaining, and that will provide habitat for species such as a white-headed woodpecker and pygmy nuthatch, which are dependent on large diameter ponderosa pine. This method of thinning has been used in Europe for a long time, but it's a, a much newer process in the United States. Um, it's very mechanized. Um, basically, what they, they have is a feller processor that uh, actually cuts the tree, delimbs it, and cuts it to length all right where it does the, um, the cutting of the tree, which means that uh, the limbs and tops are all left um, on site rather than being brought up to a landing. It also means that, that they are able to use that slash to um, move on, and so the disturbance to the ground is much reduced. One of the big benefits of this is that we are reducing the risk of catastrophic fire um, by opening up these stands the chance of it getting up into the crown and, and um, burning large areas is reduced. Um, the other benefit of it is actually that the insect and disease um, potential for these sites is reduced, at least um, at epidemic levels. What we're doing here is actually very experimental, but it's extremely good for um, wildlife. It's good forestry, and it's, it's in the public's interest. Combine a dedicated teacher, involved parents, young science students, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife's environmental education program, and you have a formula of exciting and hands-on education. Here is the story on just one of those programs being offered at a Thurston County grade school.
it was actually pretty fun coming out here and looking at all the other different all the different nests that uh the birds build it uh, it makes school more fun with science instead of just like sitting in the classroom and learning about birds in the book so many people think science is such a separate subject and it really isn't science is in our our lives all the time and it's integrated throughout math and social studies and writing and so i really saw an opportunity to work with children in, with their communication skills, uh, but also their appreciation of the environment at the same time. I learned that um, blue jays, they make circular nests, and that some other birds, they make moss nests, and then they put sticks over their eggs to protect them. Um, all areas of the curriculum are important, but this, um, my boys are really excited about science, and this is what they love to do, and it has um, sparked their interest even more in the science and the things that they can learn at school about that. My boys are in the fifth grade. Um, they're getting exposed to band. They're getting exposed to a lot of different things. So this is just one more opportunity for them to see what's out there in the real world. So it's exciting to me to see them coming out here uh, interacting with professionals in the field and seeing what the what careers lie ahead and I think that's absolutely vital in our school system I do I support it I as a taxpayer as a parent absolutely support them being out here seeing what how this stuff really relates to the real world that's important to me my reward you know my payment I guess you could say is seeing the kids you know, you open that, that cover to the box, whoa, you know, to see what's inside there and ask questions and, and, and then reiterate to you what they just learned. It, it really is an, an extremely valuable experience. I think this is better than sitting around watching movies and eating popcorn. <laughs> Here's a chance to see some of Washington's wildlife during the coming weeks. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching, and please join us again, and have a safe and happy holiday.